to welcome everybody to the AF Screen International Collaboration a Symposium this year due to Corona um, as a virtual meeting. Nevertheless, I think we have a very um, a, a good program with the top line information um, for atrial fibrillation screening during the last month, during the last year. We have a fully packed agenda and we'll have um, um, a panelist discussion at the end. And therefore, I would suggest that we go ahead and start. And Ben Friedman, who has been spearheading the uh, AF Screen International collaboration effort for four years now, will give us um, short um, feedback on what has happened during the last year. Ben, the stage is yours. Thank you. Now. Okay. So this is the AF Screen International Collaboration. We are mostly members on this, but there are a number of people who are attending who are not members. And there are also our supporters from industry um, who are joining us for the open session. Um, we started um, five years ago, so we're five years old, although this is the fourth session that for the fourth um, symposium that we've held. And some of the people who haven't been able to come actually paradoxically are able to come to this session because it's virtual. Our year in review, if, if you can see, um, our membership has grown. When we started in August 20, a twinkle in the eye of myself and Morton Rosenquist and Jeff Healy and John Cam, and then Hugh Corkins and, uh, and Jiguang Wang, and then yourself later, but also a number of other people like Greg Lip, who, who were very early, uh, Harry Cranes, a number of people who were very early on. We rapidly rose to 70 in 2015. And then um, in the last four to five years, we've grown to 180 at the time of this virtual meeting from 37 countries, depending on how you, how you count different countries. Um, this is my usual view of the world. And um, while many of you are in daytime, I'm now coming up to midnight, but I see the world this way with Australia front and center and at the top. Um, you can see that our members come largely from um, Europe, um, but also from Asia and North and South America and the odds mattering from Australia and New Zealand. And we have now probably two members from Africa. So I'm really pleased that we have um, a, a wider geographical spread. But it's not just people who are doctors and electrophysiologists, uh, specialists. We have general cardiologists and all manners of people. So it's a very broad church as well as patient representatives and lots of um, nurses and allied care, healthcare professionals. So it is a very broad church. Um, in the past year, there have been more talks at the American Heart Association last year and, and the Heart Rhythm Society. There was going to be an era, there was going to be, but there were virtual meetings and many talks at the very large virtual ESC. Um, last year, there were also talks in Asia, at OCC, Great Wall and Asian Pacific. So there is a lot of interest and I'm pleased that our group really has been um, assisting to help get screening for atrial fibrillation on the map and to really think about what we need to know. This Renata was your baby and really one of the more important things that we did um, after our initial white paper to have one on looking for atrial fibrillation, the search for AF post-stroke. Um, again, a multi-author paper published in circulation. We have white papers now as you can see coming. Um, so the goals achieved, we said we would have a post-stroke search paper it was published in November 2019. We've heard in our members section, the survey on consumer devices. Last year we said the survey was about to be sent out. Now we know it's been uh, published in, in September in the European Journal of Internal Medicine. Um, 
Giuseppe Boriani was the lead for this one and the person who actually was pushing the idea of it. So we thank him for that work. And also we heard in our member section, a very advanced draft of the AS screening and mental white paper and the consumer led screening white paper with Axel Brandis and Stavros Stavrakis. Thank you very much to those two. And to Jeff Healy, um, our co-chair for the meta-analysis and meta-regression of all the major outcome studies. Um, to you, Anata, for your persistence in putting in a very big grant. Um, and this Effect EU is on um, screening strategies in non-communicable diseases. And this is really a big grant of 6 million euros over three years. And the kickoff meeting was March 2020, but you're all already marching along. And your presentation in the last session told us that you're doing lots in that already. We saw this year the, AS, uh, the ESCAF guidelines came out in August 2020. There were four pages on screening. And I think it's important to notice that um, one of our members, Tanya Potpara, um, was the co-lead um, principal person for the guidelines. Um, the interesting thing is that there was a change from 2B to 2A for the screening of people age 75, but also a lot about when screening is recommended that people are informed about the significance and treatment and implications of detecting it and a structured referral platform. So I think really thoughtful um, guideline for this. Um, at the moment, Europeans really are the major continental guidelines for this, whereas the American guidelines are relatively silent um, on atrial fibrillation. But they are not just talking about the benefits, but warning us about the risks of things like anxiety, misinterpretation and overtreatment, and all of the other things that can happen when you have a false positive, all the tests that could be harmed do harm rather than good. So we're all obliged to be looking for um, evidence that we do more good than harm. Um, last year, towards December, um, Amelia Benjamin and NHLBI organized, uh, organized a webinar on key issues for AS screening. Um, and that was a really important initiative. Um, Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society is also preparing a guidance on atrial fibrillation screening that's in preparation. And the World Heart Federation in 2020 asked to update the atrial fibrillation roadmap. Gerhard Hendricks and myself are co-chairing that because one of the reasons they gave for wanting an update was the new technology for detection and an emphasis on screening and early detection to prevent complications. Many of our members are parts of that um, roadmap. We said last year we would advocate for industry sponsored studies. And I'm pleased to see that that has really been one of the key um, motivations or least impetus behind um, BMS and Pfizer Alliance in their Guard AF study. And also, um, no, no, no help from us and um, the Janssen J J Bayer Apple um, Heartline study um, has commenced and I'm looking forward to hearing about that later. There are also interest groups and um, we have an indigenous interest group and this year um, the Aboriginal Australian screening study was published in Heart Lung Circulation just last month. And last year at the American Heart, there was um, an abstract, uh, Stavros Stavrakis is the main person in that. Um, and this is now being written up. But what we found in both of those First Nation peoples is that AF is occurring at a much younger age, between 50 and 65. And maybe our guidelines need to be different. <clears throat> there have been a number of pharmacy um, 
studies, multinational screening awareness study um, by Philip Acosta, and a, a large study in Aachen, um, Matthias Sink, um, looking at mortality. And that has been accepted for publication. What about publications? Well, probably one of the major ones was the D2AS study. And the headline um, came out in MedPage today, just a couple of days ago, AFEB screening flop. And I think it's very dangerous to look at the headlines only. It was published in BMJ. This is uh, Stephen Rietenbochart from uh, the Netherlands, about 18,000 patients in uh, just uh, four, um, just four um, places, sorry, 18,000 patients in 100 practices. They had a trial that was a bit like the SAFE trial, a randomised trial where they randomised patients in practices to either usual care or screening. But only 45% were screened and they were younger. And you can see there was no difference. 1.62% were picked up versus 1.53 in usual care. And um, I've taken this to mean that usual care in the Netherlands is very good. If you look at their GP guidelines, they say systematic screening is not recommended. However, if you read before that, it says further recommendations are to assess the heart rhythm in each patient measured when measuring the blood pressure. So in fact, I think they are advocating in their guideline for some years, and that's what's being done. So if you only screen 45%, they tend to be younger, who have a lower incidence anyway of, of atrial fibrillation. And in your usual care, you're doing so well, you're not going to show a difference. I think it just tells us that general practitioners in the Netherlands are doing well. Um, stroke stop two, not the overall result, but just the screening result showed us that NT pro BNP increased the yield. That was in Europace this year. And a number of studies from the loop study in Denmark, um, where this is where they looked at almost 600 people aged 70 or over with one risk factor and implanted a, a cardiac monitor for about three years. And one third of them had AF of more than five or six minutes. In the paper on in circulation, we'll hear a little bit about this from Søren Diedrichsen. Um, there was quite um, a good discussion about less intense measurement and what you would expect. It's not just the duration that's important, but also the temporal dispersion and the natural history, more fibrosis. Publications, consumer-led survey, um, just been uh, published online. I think the, the, the bottom line was that 70% of healthcare professionals said that we weren't quite ready for consumer-led atrial fibrillation screening. And this is going to be a white paper from us. A CERT 3 from the Hamilton group, people over 80 in the outpatient setting, up to 30 days, 14% had atrial fibrillation. The ARIC study, one or two 14 day patches, um, more in men than women, more in white versus black, more in two versus one recording period. And our own study from Jess Orchard, a suite of e-tools, increased screening rate to 35%. We thought that was pretty good and it was cost effective. But if you look at what was uh, achieved in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, it was 45%. If we want to really make an impact, we need to go higher. This one I really want to um, um, show, and that is in the ESC abstracts of 2020, um, a paper by Brian Yan looked at the prognosis of people with screen detected atrial fibrillation versus known AF. 12,000 were screened, 2,200 with known AF, 9,700 known AF. There were 123 who were found with AF, only 25% were treated with anticoagulant. And, whoop, keep missing it. So 
the important thing is that the stroke rate of the people with no anticoagulant who were screened is this high, 6% in three years, exactly the same as people who had AF in follow-up. And it was higher, in fact, than the people with known AF who were not on anticoagulant. But here you are, if you're on anticoagulant or have no AF, you're down here. So screen detected AF, not a good thing to have. Finally, um, to keep our website going, to have all the presentations there, EndNote libraries, we have a very small secretariat, Kim Simek and Roberta Napoleoni. I'd like to thank all our support sponsors for keeping us going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. And uh, you highlight a very good point to end on. Uh, that uh, you know, AF Screen is a great repository, a great uh, place for people interested in this area, both uh, physicians, researchers, patients, and industry to uh, uh, to uh, collect data. It's a lot of effort goes to pooling uh, reference libraries and talks, and this is uh, this is all uh, very good. Um, so, seeing no questions right now, uh, why don't we get into what's going to be exciting uh, for? Uh, Michael Gibson is going to share his screen here. Um, and uh, Michael is from uh, Boston, United States. Uh, he's going to talk about the Heartline trial. And Michael comes from a great background, uh, initially doing a lot of work in uh, coronary artery disease, some e-health uh, work in looking at ST segment monitoring. That was a nice publication in Jack a little while ago. And, uh, and he's going to tell us about this uh, really uh, game-changing uh, trial that he's, uh, he's leading. So thank you, Michael. Great, thanks uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm gonna to talk about the Heartline trial. I have received research grant support uh, from both yeah. Apple and Johnson and & Johnson and Bayer uh, as well. I prepared all my own slides. These are, this is my full recitation of uh, disclosures. Well, many of us participated back in the 80s in single center studies. Then we did multi-center studies in the 80s and 90s. We finally started doing some big mega trials in the early to mid 90s. And those were great. But now we're on the precip of doing what I call giga trials. Uh, and these are largely driven by patient empowerment, uh, new technologies like apps and uh, wearables and AI. Uh, so it's a very exciting period. In the past, we had maybe a kilobytes to megabytes of data on each patient. Now we will have terabytes of data on each patient and pentabytes, many pentabytes of data from trials as a whole. What are we trying to do in the Heartline study? Uh, our goal is to see, can a wearable in people over 65 years of age, the Apple Watch, can it detect new onset AFib? Uh, so that's gonna be our primary outcome, the time to detection of new onset uh, AFib. It's going to be a trial of 180,000 patients. Uh, and the first issue is can we detect it? But the second issue is who cares? So we could detect it. Do we improve outcomes using the current standard of care? Uh, it's a virtual trial. I'm going to talk a lot about that. And it's going to cost about 1% of what a traditional randomized trial costs. So again, primary endpoint, uh, an engagement program on an app paired with the Apple Watch. Does it detect AFib earlier? By the way, I have to point out a couple of distinctions of this versus the Apple Watch study, A, this is people over 65, high risk of new onset AFib. Number two, this is a new technology. The Apple Watch study was just the laser plethysmography to detect an irregular heartbeat. This moves beyond it to a, a new technology on the watch that allows you to get a single lead EKG. And I wanna emphasize that this is not AFib diagnosis. This is AFib screening. The ultimate diagnosis will be made by the healthcare provider. Secondary endpoint is uh, going to be, you know, do we improve hardcore outcomes? This is a hospital-based trial, uh, not a hospital-based trial, sorry. This is the opposite. This is a virtual trial. Uh, in the past, things were done on paper. This is being done online. Uh, in the past, we all filled out laborious electronic case report forms. But in this study, uh, 
people are going to be followed up using apps and we're going to be looking at patient reported outcomes and we're going to adjudicate events using a claims uh, database. In terms of IRB approval, it was, you know, a thousand IRBs around the world using a thousand different consent processes. This is an electronic process that is global and there's one central IRB. Everyone sees the same video to educate them. They then elect if they want to participate and a single IRB process is used virtually to get them signed up. Uh, in the past, we were so excited to be enrolling 10 to 20,000 patients, but despite that large size, these trials were still fairly highly select in who they enrolled and that limited generalizability. But Heartline uh, is much bigger. Uh, it's not going to be as big as we thought because the pandemic has really, really curtailed people's interest in participating in trials. But it will have more <clears throat> of a real world approach, which may allow it to be more generalizable. We always used to sweat it, you know, did we have enough patients to meet the primary endpoint? Were we powered for the primary endpoint? That won't be an issue here. We'll have adequate numbers of patients to answer the primary endpoint question and probably enough patients, obviously, uh, to answer the secondary endpoints. In fact, the results may be statistically significant, but I think we're gonna have to look, you know, are these clinically significant differences that we may detect in these big giga trials? I know I'm excited, very excited, when you enroll 500 to 1,000 patients a month in a traditional paper-based trial uh, or electronic trial, now, in the Apple Heart Study, they were able to enroll 50,000 patients per month, a whole different magnitude of uh, enrollment. How are we approaching patients? Well, of course, someone can get enrolled if they are approached by their doctor or a nurse. That's still in play. But we've kind of expanded things to enroll people through social media, Facebook ads, Twitter influencers. Uh, I know I get 35 interviews on local TV and did national TV interviews. We're doing targeted advertisements with AARP uh, and, uh, you know, looking maybe for patients in the future to do electronic health records. This is sad. Currently, it takes 30,000 in, in, in trials of new oncology agents up to $250,000 per patient. This is not sustainable. We cannot spend one to $1.2 billion every time we want to evaluate a new drug or a new way a drug is uh, given. So this study cuts that cost down to about 1% of what it was, used to be. A lot of it comes through eliminating bricks and mortar, eliminating uh, a lot of the labor, uh, human capital and labor that goes into doing this, uh, the monitoring cost in a trial are about 40% because it's so labor intensive. Uh, we'll also uh, you know, allow patients to access their data at all times. That was not possible in previous studies. In fact, their family will be notified if they have a new event like an arrhythmia. Uh, a big, 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 big change is moving away from human clinical event committees to adjudicate events to using ICD-10 codes to determine if someone had uh, an event. You might say, is that going to work? Let me show you some data in a moment uh, about what we found. Compliance will be better with the, new, uh, with the old approach. The new approach in the GIGA trials will test more real world patterns of adherence and use. The payments will be uh, not to physicians and nurses, that human capital will instead flow not as an inducement to patients, but as reimbursement for their efforts, they will garner points earned that can be applied towards healthcare related uh, products. Now, one big issue is, can we replace clinical event committees uh, with a claims database in a trial like this? This is something we published this month, comparing on the left columns, left is good old traditional CEC. On the right is this new approach of using claims databases. The curves look very similar, uh, or event rates, and the answers are nearly identical. 
So this may be a much more cost-effective uh, approach uh, to getting at the same information. No differences is what we uh, concluded in our publication. Uh, safety monitoring could be better. In the past, we all know it took a while to get all those events in, get them adjudicated. But in the new world, in the new virtual trial, the claims database, as soon as that is completed, we will know if someone uh, had an event. So it may have a little more real-time application. The other issue is, you know, fair number of people went missing in the traditional approach. When you use a claims database, unless someone leaves the U.S., we will have complete ascertainment uh, of the endpoints. So it's a brave new world out there. I think we are trying to use technology to work for healthcare. We don't think healthcare workers should work for technology. We're trying to use wearables to harness technology to help work for us as trialists. Uh, and um, I don't think digital health is going to compete with uh, healthcare professionals. I think it's going to complement healthcare professionals. But I'm hopeful all these technologies will help put the patient back at the center of um, the healthcare universe. Thanks for having me today. Thank you very much, Michael. That's, uh, that's a really uh, great glimpse into the future. And, you know, as someone who does trials, you know, the ability to do uh, a trial for 1% of current costs is really a uh, necessary thing that I agree have been getting out of control over the last number of years. Could you expand a little bit on uh, how the technology works and how the trial works? to deal not with the front end of detection, but the back end of linking to healthcare interventions, anticoagulation, uh, risk factor modification, because uh, as we know, a diagnostic test is more or less useless unless you couple it with uh, evidence-based interventions. So uh, maybe you could tell us some of the neat uh, ways that this is. Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, people have to grant, to participate, they have to grant us access to their Medicaid, Medicare information uh, in the database. And uh, of course, that is replete not just with outcomes, but with a lot of the things that you just mentioned, uh, risk factors, lab values, et cetera. So, you know, each patient is gonna end up with terabytes of data uh, because there is some of the monitoring data but there's also going to be a lot of data, as you uh, suggest, based on all those risk factors. So in the U.S., we have something called the blue button. If you hit that blue button and say, I'm willing to give you my data, then uh, someone like myself and Apple and others have access to that data. Now, I have to say there is legitimate concerns about privacy. All the information is de-identified. Uh, and if an adversary wanted to re-identify someone, it would be quite, quite difficult. The other issue is the safety or the security with which that confidential information is being stored. It is being stored by Apple using probably some of the world's best security. Uh, so there wouldn't be a way for someone to break in as an adversary and uh, re-identify those patients. Uh, so uh, a lot of data. A lot of steps to protect that data and safeguards people's privacy. It's interesting how in some diseases we're further ahead of the curve, but you know, to involve, engage the patient, the patient's family, and have that information flow back in a very short feedback loop to them, uh, you know, like you know, like we've been doing for decades with uh, with insulin and blood sugar, for example. You wouldn't dream of having a diabetic send their blood sugar results to the doctor's office and get a call from a nurse. Uh, to dose their next dose of insulin, that would be ridiculous. And or, or my father-in-law gets hypoglycemic to alert a family member that granddad's glucose is 40, uh, would be a big advance. So, so this is one of the great things, and I, I speak to the kind of the pluralistic uh, makeup of the uh, AF screen. You know, we have uh, representation from a couple of the large uh, patient groups, and I think uh, this is, this is uh, invaluable. And if, you know, I compliment you and your group for going out on this bold journey. Uh, it's fraught with difficulty and anytime you assemble 150,000 patients that's going to be a challenge but uh, but really we're going to learn on the way on the fly and um, this is a really exciting future so thank you Michael. I want to say it's not it's not the end point it's not the destination this really is about the journey it really is about developing new tools new tools and new ways we go on that journey so that we can do the next trials better.
Excellent. So I will transition to introduce Soren Diedrichsen, who um, will speak about the uh, Danish loop study and some of the, the simulations they've done. It's, you know, this is a really important, it's actually the loop study, I think we all just call it the Danish loop study, but uh, everyone knows what we're talking about, a very important, uh, consequential, large uh, study looking at screening uh, using the implantable uh, cardiac monitor. Uh, I think it's uh, a great uh, repository of data and it's going to be giving us lots of great uh, data. Soren is also leading uh, the work package one for the EFFECT-EU grant. And we've all had an opportunity to work collaboratively and it's been great. So Soren, thank you for uh, joining. Thank you very much, Jeff. So, so hello everyone, and I'm very, very happy to present to you today uh, and to talk to you about simulations from the Danish loop study with relevance to other screening methodologies. And specifically, I will talk about this paper entitled Comprehensive Evaluation of Rhythm Monitoring Strategies in Screening for AFib. I have these conflicts of interest. So, conventional screening have found that we will detect previously unknown AFib in about 1 to 5% of persons with stroke risk factors. But actually, the true prevalence of stop clinical AF or any AF actually is closer to about a third of these patients. That is something we know from loop recorder screening studies, not only the Danish loop recorder study, but also several other loop recorder screening studies. And thinking about screening, we could imagine that obviously the yield of a screening will uh, depend on the duration of heart rhythm monitoring. And arguably an implanted device could act as a gold standard as to whether the patient has any AF or not. Still, we do not have much evidence to compare uh, and balance uh, between these different types of screenings in terms of uh, the balance between diagnostic yield and cost effectiveness. So in the Danish loop study, we included patients who were at least uh, 70 years old and had at least one of these four stroke risk factors. And 6,005 patients uh, were randomized in a three to one ratio to control or to receiving a loop recorder as a screening. And then we implanted these devices in those patients. And we had a guy who was uh, naive enough to take over the task of actually monitoring these patients during the lifetime of the device. So if the patient had an episode like this, the device would say, this is probably AFib. And this, this had to be adjudicated. And for me, while looking at all of these uh, loop recorder tracings, I couldn't help but wonder, what if the patients had actually been screened with another device? What would we then have seen? So for this sub-study of the loop study that I'm presenting today, the aims were to evaluate the performance of different screening strategies and to investigate factors associated with diagnostic yields. In this study, we uh, included those patients with a loop recorder in the loop study who had been followed for the lifetime of the device. That was 597 patients. So we had complete loop recorder data on those patients. And here you can see the patients that are included in four centers in Denmark. And as you can see, the mean age is about 76 years. And the, mean the, the, the gender distribution was roughly 50-50. And the chads vask score was mean four. We also had some biomarkers in these patients, including nt probin p We were then able to extract all of the raw data from the loop recorder devices. And 205 of these 600 patients had adjudicated AF. And we extracted the exact onset of every AF episode occurring after adjudication onwards and the exact duration of AF episodes. Then because we wanted to only look at AF that would not have been detected without a screening, we removed some of the AF episodes. As you can see, we removed uh, all AF that occurred after clinically detected AF. For instance, if the patient was hospitalized and the hospital also took note of an AF episode during hospitalization, and remo removed all AF that occurred after any rate rhythm control or after implantation of a 
CIED in these patients. But we ended up with uh, almost 660,000 days worth of continuous heart rhythm monitoring data and more than 20,000 AF episodes. And here you can see just a, an example of five patients uh, with a visualization of the sinus rhythm and AF that they had with, uh, visualized by the loop recorder. And you can imagine if we want to screen these patients with a 10 second EKG, we wouldn't have a high chance of actually finding AF in this patient, even though AF is highly prevalent. Also for the other patients. And what if we had taken another random EKG in daytime, another random day, or even other random days? This is exactly what we did in this simulation study. We did a, a million random EKGs only in daytime. And then if the EKG hit an AF episode in this data, it was considered a true positive. And if it missed and hit sinus rhythm, it was considered a false negative. And obviously in patients who did not have AF, it could only be true negative. And we could use this methodology to find out what is actually the sensitivity of diagnosing AF with an EKG. And what is the negative predictive value? We then went on to simulate that they had instead undergone uh, 30 second EKGs with this thumb EKG methodology, morning and evening, or holder monitorings, which last a full day, or maybe three holder monitorings with a month apart, or longer continuous monitorings as screening for AF. All of these were simulated in the same way, 1 million random times. So for the results of this simulation, an EKG had a sensitivity of about 2% for detection of AF, whereas the thumb EKGs had a sensitivity of 8% and a holder about 11%. More for three holders with a month apart, which was actually better than doing one longer holder monitoring. And the very long continuous monitorings obviously had the highest sensitivity of these examples that we simulated. As you can see, the sensitivity ranged from two to 35, 34% and negative predictive value from 66 to 74%. The really cool thing was that we could then group the uh, study population by age, for instance, to show that the sensitivity is actually higher among the older half of the population. Or we could group them by a biomarker to, to uh, show that the sensitivity is higher uh, among those with a very high NT pro BNP. So, the conclusions of this study were that compared to loop recorder, the sensitivity for uh, an EKG is about 2%, for the thumb EKGs by daily, it's about 8%, and it's up to 34% uh, uh, by 30 day continuous monitoring. And the yield increased with temporal dispersion, meaning that it's better to do more screenings uh, than it is to do one long screening. And the yield was higher among the elderly and those with higher NT pro BNP. So I would like to put this into perspective briefly. Which strategy should we use? Should we give every patient a loop recorder to screen for AF or should we merely take an EKG? Well, we can actually use this as a sort of a table to figure out how many of the population will be diagnosed if we use a screening, because we showed that the prevalence was, was 35% and the sensitivity of an EKG was 2%. So that meant that 1% of the entire population would receive a diagnosis in this way. And this is actually rather comparable to what is found in studies doing this in the real world. Similarly for the thumb EKGs and for the holder monitorings. We could do the same with the subgroups by age or by NT, pro BP or by test task. So if you like, I will argue that you can look up in this paper and then figure out how many will, will, do we want to diagnose with AFib in your at-risk population. And how about those who will be missed by the screening? Obviously, those with a high AF burden are less likely to be missed. As you can see here, the sensitivity is much higher in the rightmost column of each group, which is those patients with the highest AF burden. 
The same for those patients that do have long AF episodes lasting about a full, uh, more than a full day. And as you know, the miss rate, those with AF who are missed by the screening is just the same as the uh, one minus sensitivity. So by taking an EKG, a single EKG random time, you will still have 90% uh, chance of missing if the patient actually has long AF episodes. This is similarly to what is demonstrated in a, a new publication in Europace by Quirdal, where they showed that those with a higher AF burden are much more likely to be detected by screening with thumb EKGs. As you can see in the top lines here. Finally, we have to think about screening actually prevents hard endpoints. And how about adverse effects from screening? We don't have much data about this yet. And I think that these smart technologies uh, comprise both a, a very big challenge for us, but also a big opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Soren. And this is uh, also a very big database with a wealth of uh, information. Perhaps you could speak to, and I just encourage people on the, uh, conference, they can type in their questions and uh, we can read them out. Uh, what, what about the, the difference in finding short episodes versus long episodes, intense screening versus uh, less intense screening? Uh, do you want to speak to the issues and or uncertainty around uh, stroke risk uh, between these types of things and even uh, effective therapy perhaps? Yeah, so with regards to the difference uh, from episodes, uh, we know from the pacemaker cohorts, uh, for instance, the assert study, that uh, there is probably some dose response effect with regards to the longer episodes. Those patients who are at risk of stroke are more likely to have, uh, the risk is, more, is, is probably connected with AF episode duration. Uh, so it is also reassuring, of course, to see that uh, the screening is, uh, works better to detect patients with a high burden or with long AF episodes, um, if that was what you meant. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we have two questions and we're doing well for time. Um, uh, the first question is um, regarding um, previous publications. So there was a nice publication by Paul Ziegler and others. Uh, around you know, doing this, taking a continuous and simulating shorter episodes. Uh, what do you think this adds uh, on top of what's, uh, what's been out there? There's uh, lots of potential answers for that, but uh, what do you think it adds in terms of uh, addition to other previous studies or will add? I think uh, one addition of this study is that we, we have a sample size that allows us to see the difference between uh, different population characteristics. For instance, we could demonstrate that uh, we know what the underlying AF burden actually is for these patients. And we could demonstrate that uh, we, are, we are more likely to detect AF when the burden is higher. And the burden is higher among those who are older and have AF, for instance. So uh, this, this study uh, can be used to, to look a little bit at where's the burden highest? And then also where's uh, the likelihood of detecting AF actually highest? So that is one addition I think we can make. Also, uh, we, were, we were actually able to look a little bit at the timely distribution of AF episodes because a lot of previous studies have looked at, at uh, continuous monitoring as a means of screening. And of course, you will detect a lot of AF with continuous monitoring, but maybe some of the AF you will detect will not have the same clinical relevance. So we also simulated time point screenings in this study. And we, we didn't find everyone with subclinical AF by using a time point screening, for instance, an EKG or the thumb EKGs, but those we found had a higher burden. And we didn't miss too many of those with a high burden when we did, for instance, the thumb EKGs. And I would like to point uh, to make one point here, which is uh, maybe perspective is this a little bit uh, to uh, PPG or photoplatosmography methods, because uh, 
the way that the Apple Watch, the Huawei Watch works is actually doesn't continuously monitor the heart rate. It takes snapshots all, the, all of the time to see if the heart rate is irregular. And that is a little bit like doing these thumb or one uh, handheld devices. And then if the heart rate is um, irregular when the, when the snapshot is done and it stays irregular next time and next time it does this photo plethysmography snapshot, then uh, you can do uh, uh, a single lead EKG with the device instead. So in this way, um, this all talks to uh, us starting to detect maybe those with more AFib uh, than, than uh, what we will see with continuous monitoring. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, should I pass the torch to Renata? Okay, and I see here online Peter Noseworthy. So I'm wondering whether you might be able to present. My information was that you cannot make uh, this time, but Maybe if not, I know that we have recorded um, the talk by um, uh, Peter Noseworthy. He comes from the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic. And over the last um, decades, uh, we have tried to explore the ECG and mine the data that are contained in the electrocardiogram. Uh, but over the last years, uh, these efforts have been reinforced and last year we saw very nice papers, two very nice intensively discussed papers from Peter Noseworthy and his group um, predicting um, cardiac dysfunction from the ECG but also predicting atrial fibrillation um, incidence uh, from a sinus rhythm ECG. And we asked him to give a little update on AI and machine learning uh, um, using EMR, biomarkers, and 12 lead ECG to predict atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation related events. So maybe we could now hear Peter Noseworthy's talk. So we'll just play it. I'm muting it up. I'm muting it up now. Physiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning using electronic medical record data, biomarkers, and the 12 lead ECG to predict atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation related events. Our work is funded through benefactor funds as well as NIH, and we have filed patents related to some of the technology using AI for ECG interpretation. However, none of these are related to any financial relationships relevant to the current talk. Everybody on the call today knows that current US guidelines, at least, have not recommended widespread population screening with ECG for atrial fibrillation. And the reason is that we don't have good clinical trial data to demonstrate that screening with ECG at the population level actually translates to better treatments and better health outcomes overall. Even though we know that we can screen the population to identify patients with atrial fibrillation, and people certainly with established atrial fibrillation benefit from treatment, this link is not yet made with randomized clinical trial data, and it's too early to endorse this kind of uh, recommendation. So folks on this call are particularly interested about how we can stratify the general population to identify patients who would benefit from screening and ultimately treatment so that we can prevent strokes and improve atrial fibrillation care more globally. There are a number of ways we could assess for atrial fibrillation or AF risk. Certainly we could use an extended monitor to actually try to diagnose this, but it's costly and invasive. And we don't know somebody's had atrial fibrillation until they actually have it. And we're not actually predicting it, we're just diagnosing it. Other modalities to try to predict it might include data from the electronic health record, which is 
uh, limited in its resolution, but readily available and also available to clinicians at the point of care. We could use biomarkers, but that requires a blood draw and it's costly, although it does potentially hint at mechanism and offer opportunities for individualized care. At Mayo Clinic, we're very interested in the use of ECGs, and even though this is limited to a single data point, ECGs are ubiquitous and low cost and non-invasive, so we could apply uh, sort of batch uh, approaches to ECG interpretation to try to stratify patients who might benefit from AF screening or treatment. So how will machine learning help us integrate all of this and make sense of the data that are available? There are a lot of studies recently, especially in the past couple of years, that have used ML approaches to make sense of massive amounts of data to risk stratify patients, and I'll just show a couple. This study, uh, which was a population-based study of patients who had biomarker data, used ML techniques to look for a biomarker signature of AF risk, and they were able to identify and demonstrate that these models that incorporate biomarkers outperform more standard models that use just demographics, including age, sex, or BMI. Similarly, data can be extracted from the electronic health record, either as structured data elements or using natural language processing. And the current model that most of us use for risk stratification would be the charge AF model, which includes things like heart failure, age, myocardial infarction, et cetera. But a lot of these features can be extracted from the medical record. And when we use a time varying neural network, we can actually sort out the relative timing of these sorts of clinical factors and better risk stratify. And here we improve the AUC from 0.73 to 0.83 by using uh, data extracted from the electronic health record. At Mayo, we've been very interested in using the 12 lead ECG because we have a large uh, database of digital files that are all linked to electronic health records and allow us to study signals that we think might be hidden in plain sight. And we trained the model to pick up subtle features on the ECG that are present in normal sinus rhythm, but that may indicate risk of future atrial fibrillation. And we did that by identifying patients who had multiple ECGs, at least one of which demonstrated atrial fibrillation, and then looking in a window of interest for other ECGs that were in normal sinus rhythm. We then trained a convolutional neural network to pick up subtle findings on the ECG that indicate this risk of atrial fibrillation. And the results were quite favorable. Using a single ECG in the primary analysis, we achieve an AUC of 0.87. And if we use multiple ECGs from within a single individual, this approach is 0.9. And this is clearly much better than many risk stratification schemes that we use in everyday practice, including the chads fast score or even CHARGE AF. After we developed this model, we got a call from a neurologist who had seen a patient who had been followed at Mayo Clinic for nearly 30 years and had suffered two uh, presumably cardioembolic, but uh, strokes of undetermined significance. In 2014, when this patient had her first stroke, there was no evidence of atrial fibrillation on monitoring, and he had opted not to anticoagulate. Then at the end of 2019, the patient returned again with another stroke that looked cardioembolic. There was still a normal sinus rhythm. And it wasn't until a couple of weeks later that the patient actually developed atrial fibrillation, confirming the likely diagnosis underlying both of these strokes. However, when we look back through all the ECGs over time, you can see that there's a signal of risk exceeding the threshold for what we would consider a positive ECG 10 or 12 years before the first stroke. So could this signal of risk warranted monitoring earlier and could we have prevented this first stroke? Or could this uh, excess risk at the time of the first stroke have warranted empiric anticoagulation even though no atrial fibrillation could have been diagnosed? These are the hypotheses that we're interested in testing next. We then wanted to look in a prospective study and we or a prospective cohort, and we collaborated with some of our neurology colleagues to use the Mayo Clinic study of aging, which is a study uh, originally designed to study dementia. And what we can see here is that the AI output has a graded relationship to the risk of incident atrial fibrillation over time. And this is quite comparable to what was seen with clinical risk factors using the CHARGE-AF score. 
As a simple rule of thumb, a score of 0.5 translated to a cumulative incidence of AFib of about 20% at two years and 50% at 10 years, which we believe may be actionable numbers uh, for clinical practice. The next question, of course, is we can predict atrial fibrillation, but do we actually pre predict stroke? And looking in the same core, you can see that uh, very high scores over 0.5 uh, were actually associated with an increase in, in the risk of stroke. Uh, the next thing, of course, will be understand if this is a modifiable risk with treatment. <laughs> We're now interested in testing this prospectively, and in the fall of uh, this year, we're going to start enrolling in what's called the Batch Enrollment for Artificial Intelligence Guided Intervention to Lower Neurologic Events, or BEAGLE trial. This is going to use a combination of data from uh, digital phenotyping using the electronic health record, as well as the ECG. The ECG will be used to identify patients at risk of atrial fibrillation, and the EHR will identify patients who don't have anticoagulation contraindications, people who we actually want to indi would want to diagnose atrial fibrillation. We'll also, we'll not be looking at patients who are very young and at very low risk of stroke, because in these uh, situations, we don't need to diagnose asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. We'll identify these potentially eligible patients, and then we will uh, be monitoring them, in this case using a body guardian device over time, to see how well the AI ECG predicts incident atrial fibrillation. If this is successful, the next step, of course, will be an intervention trial looking at whether we can modify risk of subsequent cardioembolic stroke. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we can translate this on a population level, but we're already starting to use this in our clinical practice at Mayo Clinic. This is a screenshot of an EPIC window. We, that's our electronic health record. This is my own medical record. And you can see that under the cardiology tab, there's a button here called AI ECG dashboard. And if you click on this, it opens up all of the prior ECGs for a patient and the output from all of the AI models that we have developed. What you can see here is that I had my ECG performed when I was 39. It looked like I was 37 at the time. It could tell that I was male. And reassuringly, it didn't think I had a low ejection fraction, atrial fibrillation, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So reassuring, but not terribly informative. In other patients, this is that patient who suffered two cardioembolic but strokes of uncertain significance. You would be able to potentially uh, change treatment. And you can see that the probability of atrial fibrillation was high in that individual patient. So going back to our schema, uh, going from the population to treatment, what I think we've demonstrated here is that we can screen for atrial fibrillation risk, but there are still a lot of unknowns. The main unknown, of course, is that we don't know that screening at the population level can actually improve health outcomes overall. All we've really established at this point is that we can identify patients who are at increased risk of atrial fibrillation. The next question is whether actually fitting these patients with various monitors will detect more clinically relevant atrial fibrillation and whether treating these patients can help prevent stroke in the long run. At Mayo, we're interested in using the electronic health record and ECG, but ultimately biomarkers may be another part of this puzzle. And if we can use machine learning to integrate what we learn from all of these uh, data points, we may be able to uh, use extended monitoring approaches more intelligently and ultimately target treatment to people who need it most. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak on this today. It was a, a very nice um, overview. Thank you for uh, having played uh, this talk by Peter Noseworthy. And I'm always impressed um, how much uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence can pick up subtleties that we cannot see even with our eyes. Um, and um, it's fantastic that these data, because so far they are more or less a black box in the algorithm, um, that they can be replicated in um, uh, clinical uh, samples that it can prospectively and externally be validated. And um, I think this is a really a new road uh, to go and um, interventional trials, of course, uh, will be um, the final proof that um, artificial intelligence may help us improve um, patient care. Um, if um, there are any comments from the 
um, from the panel. I would invite everybody to give their input. Are you, do you feel all feel confident with um, using artificial intelligence? How much will it advance atrial fibrillation screening or is it more to specific settings to hospital based settings where you have 12, where you have 12 lead ECGs, where you have more information available? Well, I, I think of 12 lead ECGs as relatively uh, clinically available. And what's attractive about this, in my opinion, is that most patients at some point get a 12 lead ECG in the United States. Many people get it uh, when they go on Medicare at the age of 65. And that allows us to have a large database of digital ECGs that we could screen retrospectively. So that's the idea behind the Beagle study. Basically, we're going to screen all patients who had an ECG at Mayo Clinic. And if they've uh, consented for research participation, we're reaching out to them through the patient portal and inviting them to participate in a screening study. It's relatively small scale, it's a pilot study, but we're going to look at a very enriched population, we hope, who are very high risk of uh, incident atrial fibrillation and hopefully demonstrate proof of concept that we can uh, screen individuals in that manner. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for joining in person now and answering the questions. Um, with respect to time, I would uh, go over and lead over to Amelia Benjamin's talk, and it's a great pleasure, you can imagine, to have Amelia here. She usually, usually cannot make it to the ESC conference, and therefore this virtual meeting has an um, absolute advantage that we can have here online. Amelia Benjamin, and I must say, she has been pioneering uh, atrial fibrillation research at the population level, a risk factor research in atrial fibrillation, and is now also very deeply involved in atrial fibrillation screening. And last year, she had the huge task to um, organize a NIH workshop, um, on a virtual workshop um, on atrial fibrillation screening. And maybe you can give us some insights on the uh, main outcomes of this workshop. Amelia. Thank you. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, both yes. very well. Great. Thank you very much for your gracious introduction. And it's an incredible honor to actually be able to present and to participate in the AF screen uh, in collaboration. It's something that I deeply admire and, and kudos to the people who have led it and really led the way for international consortia. Um, I'm going to present on behalf of the NHLBI virtual workshop, and I want to acknowledge this was definitely a team sport. I deeply appreciate all of my co um, collaborators who um, reviewed multiple drafts of slides, documents, et cetera, and particularly a shout out to my co-chairs, Dr. Go and Dr. Al-Khatib, and to my NHLBI colleagues, Dr. Nickens and Dr. Cooper. These are my disclosures. So the purpose of the workshop was to catalyze atrial fibrillation screening research to advance innovative, resource efficient, and clinically relevant studies in diverse populations to improve the diagnosis, the management, and prognosis of individuals with undiagnosed AF. Frankly, much like the AF screen um, collaboration, very similar objectives. However, our objective was not to issue guidelines, but really to shine a light on what would be the most innovative research question. We had five domains, the role of opportunistic screening, AF as a risk factor, risk marker, or both, relations between AF burden with long-term monitoring and outcomes slash treatments, the designs of potential randomized controlled systematic AF screening with clinically relevant outcomes, and the role of AF screening after ischemic stroke. So rather than do a kind of do lists of potential research questions, I thought what I would do is really focus on what were the themes that bubbled up. So it will be no surprise to people here that um, when we thought about research knowledge gaps and research opportunities, we really focused on the great importance of diverse data sources and diverse study design. And I think um, most of the people on this have really talked about the need for T0 all the way to T4 translation to community research. So we know that there's a role for basic and mechanistic in terms of drilling down on some of the mechanisms of screen detection. 
critical that we need to triangulate the data between administrative electronic medical records, registries, pragmatic trials, and randomized controlled trials. AF Screen has really led the way in emphasizing the vital importance in being able to harmonize data across studies so that we can come up with um, answers that are generalizable and really drill down potentially on subgroups of individuals. So um, we advocated for the importance of being able to meta-analyze and share data. Dr. Noseworthy has been a leader in the whole field of artificial intelligence, and there is absolutely no question that this is a technology and an advance for all of our research. And, and Dr. Noseworthy and colleagues that may have really been at the forefront. So I don't want to be the skunk at the party, but I also think that um, I have many of my mentees, you know, everybody wants to do an AI grant. And I think we also need to be sober about what can AI do and what are the potential limitations of artificial intelligence. And, and as Dr. Noseworthy elegantly um, is drilling down on, we need to really understand the implications for management. Part of the issue with artificial intelligence is that very frequently there's a black box feeling to it and there's a lack of transparency about the underlying algorithms. There have been some concerns about reproducibility. Many of the results of artificial intelligence are very constrained or very data set specific and do not necessarily generalize to other contexts. We also don't know the advantage over standard risk prediction models, although as indicated by Dr. Noseworthy, we're starting to get insights into that. I suspect in the end of the day, they'll probably be complementary approaches. There are real consistent concerns about privacy that we haven't really addressed, um, particularly with some of the screening um, technologies that are consumer facing. What is the potential for hacking? What is the potential for invasion of privacy with say, facial recognition software, et cetera. And um, one of my deepest concerns is that artificial intelligence is as good as the underlying data structure. And we know in all the um, healthcare systems in the world, there is a fundamental bias of the data that ends up in the data set and the data that is sort of not in, not in the data set and the people who are not included in the data set. So is artificial intelligence going to recapitulate many of the underlying biases and structural inequities of our healthcare system? That's a very profound point that I hope we arrive at at the end. Um, this is a beautiful article by Friedman, Schnabel, and Hawkins in German Cardiology that really underscored one of the themes of the workshop, which is that we need to understand how AF prognosis and treatment vary by the AF detection method going all the way from incidental to ILR, CIED, and by AF burden. So clearly, if, and as I think very elegantly um, demonstrated by our earlier speaker, um, Dr. Um, Nidrickson, um, it, 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 you know, if, if you screen once, you're going to detect a lot less, but it's probably going to be more specific. Um, and so we, we need to think about what is you know, how do we balance that um, in the patient populations that we screen as elegantly demonstrated earlier? What is the role of AF risk markers to define risk of AF and its complications? Much of this has been already alluded to, the critical importance and frankly, undermined utilization of the electrocardiogram as indicated by Dr. Noseworthy. Genomics are gonna play a role, I suspect within our practicing lifetime in the next decade, people will walk in, you know, maybe a blood stick, get their genome done, and then we're gonna know, you know, think about maybe we should be screening this person, maybe we shouldn't be screening this person, et cetera. Transcriptomics, biomarkers, proteomics, metabolomics, et cetera. And of course, I think more sophisticated imaging can help us understand uh, atrial fibrillation risk through atrial myopathy and get at some of the mechanisms. Presumably, we're going to get to the point where we can develop more sophisticated algorithms to predict risk. Um, this is an example by Wang and Lubitz, um, who looked at people at um, high versus low polygenic risk score and really splayed them out by their clinical risk profile. 
One of the things that was alluded to in the closed session is that much of the screening literature, and frankly, much of the atrial fibrillation literature has been dominated by stroke as an outcome. And that's a bit of a missed opportunity. First, we know that actually the most common outcome after atrial fibrillation is mortality, with followed by heart failure and stroke is the third. Stroke, stroke is very important because of the disabling, but of course, heart failure and death are pretty important outcomes also. So we need to expand the outcomes that we're looking at, including dementia, heart failure, MI, systemic emboli, renal, et cetera, quality of life, patient-centered outcomes as alluded to by others, death. And we need to look at healthcare utilization, including downstream testing, some of the dark side of screening everybody and some of the consumer-facing devices, the cost, the anxiety, the complications from unnecessary treatments, and something we haven't really talked about and maybe is more important in the U.S. context, but clinician liability and burden. Clinicians increasingly are having patients present with newly diagnosed device-detected AF, and they feel like the tsunami is coming. And frankly, you know, maybe this isn't an issue in other countries, but clinicians, particularly frontline clinicians, are already profoundly burned out pre-pandemic. It's gotten worse. Um, we think that we need to be thinking deeply about, you know, how do we use AF screening? And more importantly, how do we vary the patient subgroups so that we look at people varying by age, by sex, race, ethnicity, urban, rural, comorbidities, practice settings, and countries? The global burden is about 46 million. We um, know, however, that there is marked heterogeneity, which probably partly reflects ascertainment biases. So um, I asked my librarian yesterday to do a PubMed search and a Web of Science search, 41,000 in the last five years, visualized by authors' institutional affiliation, the top 25 profoundly skewed towards North America, Europe, Western Europe, and Asia. Nigeria, the highest ranking low income country on the list was number 64, only had 39 papers, 0.094% of the total. We know that in, this is the global distribution of race ethnicity, and we know that of people of African ancestry, 17% of the global population of PubMed search, again done yesterday, 701 mentions of individuals who are African American from the African content, 0.779%. So um, I think the question for the discussion, and hopefully people can put this in the chat, is are we designing a research tool that's going to be for the worried well? Can, how will the AS screening research community ensure that we study diverse populations? We know that there, at least in the United States, and probably globally, there are profound inequities. This is insurance rates um, and access to care. We also know that um, Younger adults tend to be screened. How do we make sure we include enough older adults? And how do we make sure that we include enough ethnic diversity and global diversity? Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Amelia, for this excellent talk and very comprehensive overview on research topics and uh, knowledge gaps. And um, maybe, uh, Ben, you want to answer how are we going to um, uh, really have diversity in AF screen. I think you put a lot of effort into this. Yeah, I think it's very hard. Uh, and I'm really aware of this. Uh, I'm co-chairing a group with uh, Gerhard Hendricks um, for the World Heart Federation. And you, you realize what little knowledge there is in Africa. Um, about atrial fibrillation. We have really, it's just under surveyed. Even in India, one of the most populous nations, um, you have uh, evidence of, of what's happening and that it's not that common. But if you go out with a handheld device with village health workers, you find it's very common because old people, older people, don't seek health care. They have a stroke, they die, they don't go to hospital. And um, so we are only seeing what we know, and you're quite right, we do not see what's happening out there in the world. I think you, you have to be forced to think about things that are outside your own um, sphere of knowledge. And, and uh, I think you highlight this really well in, in your talk, Amelia. I Thank don't you. have an answer. So I'm
Yeah, I'm really interested if people can put in the chat and, and how can everybody on this call really commit to ensure that within their own scope of research practice, they can have diverse and inclusive um, uh, participation. One of the things I worry about with the um, all the studies done with the Apple Watch, I work at an urban safety net hospital. My patients cannot afford an iPhone. Um, many of the applications are only available on Apple. Apple has done an enormous service. I'm not knocking Apple. It's an enormous service, but um, many um, uh, people of color, African Americans, Latinx, et cetera, they can't afford an Apple Watch. So how are we going to ensure that we reach patients that are not hard to reach, they are hardly reached? I just wanna say that in the study, uh, if you can't afford the watch, you are provided a watch as a loaner. Um, so we, we really want to make sure there's no economic barrier to participation. You do raise important points, though, about uh, if it is effective, how do you roll that out to society in general? And, maybe and, and Dr. Gibson, how does this? Please go ahead. No, I'm just curious, Dr. Gibson, how do people know that that's available as an option? When they when they go to uh, you know hear the video and sign up, um, they're told that that is an option. If they if they can't pay, and they, they greatly lowered the price. I don't know the price, but they greatly lowered it. I think it's about fifty dollars or something. But if they can't afford that, they then um, can get the watch as a loaner. So there really should be no economic barrier to get signed up if you're interested in participating. I would have another uh, question related to artificial intelligence, which has taken um, a lot of um, the discussion during this uh, part of the session uh, to Peter Noseworthy. Uh, we know that artificial intelligence can create uh, bias, racial ethnicity bias, and can even um, perpetuate it. Um, have you observed um, such types of bias or are looking into this in ECG uh, data? Yeah, that's a critical question. I think that's probably one of the most important things about the application and generalizability of these technologies. Um, we're just now starting to work on that. So we have uh, sought collaboration with various um, investigators from around the world to look at external validity. And uh, for a, a, a number of our algorithms, it's actually working quite well. The ones we've looked at so far are the low ejection fraction detection algorithm in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we've validated in uh, South American and Asian populations for both of those. We did publish in circ a and &E a sub-study of our initial uh, low ejection fraction detection algorithm looking by racial and ethnic subgroups, and the performance of the algorithm was consistent across various groups. The caveat there, of course, is that those are uh, it's a it's a diverse cohort from within the Mayo Clinic cohort. So the uh, data are collected using the same protocols, using the same machines that are stored the same way. So the bigger question is whether they perform well on various form factors and ECGs performed in real life around the world. And those are all critical uh, components of building out uh, our knowledge base. Thank you very much. And important that you really look into this. Um, Emilia um, um, is suggested to have um, a question and we thought that we might have a little bit more time to discuss this. Um, a final question to all the panelists, really one sentence, what uh, would be the most important um, research that needs to be done um, next year uh, that we can report um, on at the next AF screen meeting? Um, maybe we start uh, with uh, Jeff. Yeah, just unmuting. So I, I think some more data from the ongoing screening cohorts will be important. I think that will be uh, quite useful. Uh, there probably won't be any data on uh, interventions for the subclinical atrial fibrillation for another two to three years. So I think uh, more on the uh, <clears throat> challenges, the successes of screening, some of the health economics around screening, and maybe some of the biomarker studies as well. And Peter Noseworthy, what would be your suggestion? Uh, I would agree with Jeff. I'm waiting with bated breath for the results of NOAA and Artesia, but we have a little while to go with that. So I think right now we'll be looking at uh, screening. Um, and I think our group should have some more information about the validity of these AI algorithms that I think will be important to know whether we should pursue that further. Yeah, 
Sören, die da rechts ist. Ob es not available. Uh, uh, Mike Gibson. I think in the short term, uh, shoring up our predictions of asymptomatic AFib using AI and other tools could be critical in the short term. But I think I agree with everyone. We're just holding our breath to see, you know, if we intervene and treat these people, do we improve outcomes? That's that's what we're all waiting on. And so you've joined again. Yes, uh, sorry, I was I was here, but uh, my screen wasn't. But uh, well, I, I think I could uh, make a little teaser uh, that we uh, in the loop study in Denmark we are uh, approaching uh, end of follow up. So I, I believe uh, within one year from now we will report on that, and then we will at least have a little bit more information as to whether uh, a loop recorder could uh, serve as one way of preventing hard endpoints. And I'm very uh, curious about that, obviously. Thank you. And Emilia? So I would say that I am biased by the last six months of working at an urban safety net hospital. The searing, glaring, profound, disturbing, unconscionable healthcare inequities that we have observed, and also because of the obvious um, violence against individuals of African ancestry. To me, the most important thing that every researcher needs to be grappling with is what am I doing to make sure that I am reaching people that are not hard to reach, but hardly reached? How can I make my protocols more diverse, inclusive? It's not going to happen just passively. We know that the past is the best predictor of the future. We've had dismal enrollment as documented in all atrial fibrillation studies by um, Dr. Rodriguez from Stanford in a very short report. Um, how are we as a consortium, AF Screen, gonna not be showing up with Dr. Rodriguez recapitulating the dismal track record of our atrial fibrillation colleagues? How are we gonna have 100% reporting of race, ethnicity, et cetera? Very well, thanks. Um, and I would like to shed light, um, shed light on the black box of screen detected atrial fibrillation because we do not understand what this really means um, either. And so I would um, focus my research on that. And this way, I would like um, to thank everybody for joining this meeting, the fourth meeting of um, AF Screen, the fifth anniversary of AF Screen, and the first virtual meeting, which was fully packed with new information, lots of discussions, which we can continue offline, I guess. And um, I cannot but give the last word uh, to uh, the person who is spearheading every, um, all the effort and who is far past midnight right now, uh, but he uh, must have the last word, Ben Friedman, please. Yes, I'm, I'm pleased that I'm still awake. Thank you very much, Renata, for your great sharing of this. It's been a really provocative section. We will soon have stroke stop and loop telling us what's going on. But I think we need to listen to what Amelia's been saying. And we look for atrial fibrillation. And yet when we see that you can prevent strokes and potentially death and even dementia, and in the largest uh, population in the world, when you actually look out into the community, not in the tertiary type studies, you see that the rate of anticoagulation is less than 10%. And um, so before we start looking too much, we also need to work out how we can ensure that those who are poor um, uh, and those who can't afford it, those who are not reached, um, might be getting treatment that might let them uh, prevent strokes. I think we need to do that in concert, but we need to know what the answer is, whether it's worth looking. So the principle is really crucial. And what we're doing, I think, is the right way of going about it. But we need to keep in mind that for many people, getting treatment is actually not even remotely possible, even if we were to be able to look for it. So with that sobering thought, um, I'd like to thank you very much, Renata. I'd like to thank all of the people who've been speaking and all of the um, people who are out there in, in the world, um, in the chat room um, for attending um, and uh, I'd like to say that all of this will be uh, available on our website um, so that those who missed it will be able to see it. Thanks so much, Renata. Thank you very much to all the speakers.
But Ben, that inequity in treatment and access is a big confounder that drives the differences we see in observational studies. So to say that people who were not treated with this had worse outcomes is horribly confounded by this access issue and uh, it's really tragic. It is, it is. Thanks everyone, really great compliment of speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Right way to win. Thank you. Thank you Bye. Great. Tremendous honor. Bye.